punches Officer McDonald in the face while reaching for his 38 caliber revolver, which he has in his waistline. He punches McDonald in the face as he reaches for his 38 caliber revolver, which is in his waistband. Okay, Rhiannon. Put your pencil down near pen. Lee Harvey Oswald points the pistol at McDonald this far away and fires. As he is pointing the pistol, McDonald grabs the pistol. The hammer comes down and hits McDonald's thumb, not allowing it to dis to engage, or he shot at point blank range in the stomach. So again, pistol comes out, he quickly grabs it, the hammer goes down and hits his thumb, which does not allow it to hit the firing mechanism to engage the pistol. At that point, another police officer, Cole Cox Oswald, boo. And you can see in the videos, I'll show you, that he's going to have a mark over his eye. Another police officer, boom, Cole Cox, Oswald. They get him under control. They handcuff him. And they take him to a police car in front of the Texas Theater where they're going to transport him downtown to Dallas Police Headquarters in downtown Dallas. Okay, this whole scenario making sense? So we have a suspect in custody. Now, we're going to come back because we're going to take it back up when he's sitting in the back of the police car in front of the Texas Theater. But first, we're going to go back to Parkland Hospital and let you know what's going on there while Oswald's being apprehended. Because the last thing we told you is that the president had passed away and been given the last rites of the church. Malcolm Kilduff had announced the president's death. Robert Shaw had announced the governor's condition, right? And I kind of gave you a prelude to this because what's the discussion going to be at the hospital? Where's the body going to have its autopsy? In Dallas or in Washington? So, continuing events back at Parkland Hospital. Now, like I mentioned to you, since President Kennedy was killed in Dallas, Texas state law required that the president's autopsy be done in Dallas by civilian doctors. And the man that pressed the most for that, the man that insisted on that, was Dr. Earl Rose, who was the Dallas Medical Examiner. And it was his job to make sure that that body stayed in Dallas. Dr. Earl Rose was the medical examiner who insisted, to the very end, that the president's body stay in Dallas. In his mind, it was just another murder. And the autopsy would stay in Dallas. Now, as I told you in the pre-lecture, so to speak, the man that insisted that the president's body be taken back to Washington, D.C. was Secret Service Agent Roy Kellerman, the head of Secret Service detail for the president. And he disagreed with Rose. And he disagreed with Rose and he was willing to break Texas state law for three specific reasons and take the body back to Washington, D.C. for autopsy. And again, he did this, he broke the law and made this decision for three reasons. We already talked about that. Number one, he believed that the most important thing was the safety of Vice President Johnson, who he knows is going to be the next president. And his job is to get him in a safe environment and his environment to be saved is back in D.C. So the first reason why he broke the law and insisted that the president's body go back is he wanted Lyndon Johnson back. Second part of that we talked about. Lyndon Johnson stated he wasn't going back to D.C. without Jackie. Jackie Kennedy. And the third reason was Jackie Kennedy wasn't going back without the body of her husband. So it became a domino effect. And that's why Roy Kellerman made the decision that he would break Texas state law and take the president's body back to Washington. Now, I just want you to listen. This is what Dr. Rose was later quoted as saying about this incident right here. He said, quote, I was in their way. 
I was face to face with Secret Service agent Roy Kellerman and was trying to explain to him that Texas law applied in the instant case of the death of the president and that the law required an autopsy to be performed in Texas. No one was in charge of the situation. Agent Kellerman tried three tactics to have his way. He asserted his identity as representing the Secret Service. He appealed for sympathy to Mrs. Kennedy and used body language to attempt to bully or should I say intimidate. At no time did I feel I was in physical danger because he and the others were armed. I was not looking at Kellerman's gun. I was looking at his eyes, and they were very intense. His eyes said he meant to get the president's body back to Washington. Well, this disagreement between Kellerman and Rose led to heated discussions, unbelievable swearing, and even the pulling of guns by both the Secret Service on one side and the Dallas police on the other. They were pulling guns. All of this in front of a grieving Jackie Kennedy. She witnessed it all. One side pulls guns, the other side pulls guns. Swearing, cussing, etc. Somebody has got to step in and make cooler heads prevail. Who steps in and tries to initiate a compromise on this bad situation? Kenneth O'Donnell. Very good. Kenneth O'Donnell steps in and says, hey, let's try this. How will this work? You remember Admiral George Berkey, who was on the video, said he was the president's physician. He said to the nurse, the president has Addison's disease and gave her the two vials, and she stuck them in her pocket. Well, he was there. And what Kenneth O'Donnell said is, let's make a deal here. If Admiral Berkey, the president's personal physician, stays with the body, doesn't leave its side, the entire trip back and throughout the autopsy, how about if we move the president's body and take him back to D.C.? That was his hope. Well, Kellerman's side agreed to that, but not so much Rose's, okay? But Kenneth O'Donnell steps in and says, here's what we'll do. Admiral Berkey will escort the president's body, never leave its side, from the time it leaves the hospital until the autopsy is completed and we'll take the president back to D.C. That was the compromise. Well, we told you that Clint Hill was asked to get a casket, right? Mm -hmm. The casket had arrived, and when the casket arrived, and the word was out that the president was going back to Washington, Lyndon Johnson then departed Parkland Hospital. So he departed before the president's body. And that's when Malcolm Kilduff got up and said to the press that the president had died. You remember that scenario? So Johnson gets the word that the casket's there. Johnson gets the word that they're going back to Washington. And Johnson leaves Parkland Hospital. Now keep in mind, how did Johnson get to Texas, Rachel? Did he come with the president? No, he came on his own plane. So many assumed he was going back to his plane to fly back. Keep that in mind. Well, finally at 2.08 p.m., we're still talking about November 22nd, right? At 2.08 p.m., the casket was loaded into a hearse outside of Parkland Hospital and left for Love Field at 2.08 p.m. Vice President's gone under Secret Service protection. Back to D.C., the President's body is being loaded on the hearse and leaves at 2.08 which will take us to the next subtopic, which is departure back to Washington, D.C. Now, what time did I tell you the hearse left? It arrived at Love Field at 2.14. They didn't mess around, they got there. So it left at 2.08 and arrived at Love Field at 2.14. Now, there were Secret Service agents and military flight attendants and the pilot and all these people that were already on Air Force One, right? Getting prepared for the President's body. What's your first question if you're them? Say it. No, they're not worried about him yet. That's a good point, though. What, what's, your, what's your concern or what, what's your question back in your mind? Once the President's body gets here, where's it going to go? 
Is it going to go underneath like a piece of luggage? Or is it going to go elsewhere? Well, the Secret Service had already made up their mind that the President's body would not be put underneath, in their words, quote, like a piece of luggage. It was going to be put on the airplane, not underneath, where normally it probably would be better stored. But they had made the decision that the President's body would not fly below the aircraft like a piece of luggage. So, prior to the President getting there, President's body, excuse me, they had already taken out two rows of seats on the airplane to make a place for it to sit. If you've ever been on an airplane, you're probably not going to have a space that big. So they took out two rows of seats to make a place for the President's body on the airplane above, not below. Now, the President's body arrives and they begin to load the casket onto Air Force One, but they run into several problems doing so. So the casket arrives at Air Force One, they begin to load it, and they have three problems. Anybody guess what one of the problems might be? First of all, it's very heavy and difficult to carry up the mobile staircase. They had a heck of a time, and obviously you don't want to drop the thing. But I mean, they had a heck of a time. And I think Naya might have said this, once they got to the door of the aircraft, the casket was too wide and would not fit through the door. They didn't want to tip it. So what did they do? They broke off the handles, so and it did barely fit through the door. The trouble then was, it wouldn't make the turn. You ever been in an airplane? When you walk in, you got this kind of wall right here. You go around to get to your seat. Well, they couldn't get the casket. Once they got it through the door, they couldn't get it to turn. So they basically took a saw and cut that wall out of the airplane so they could get the casket around. Because this plane, they don't, no plane's preparing for luggage. They're preparing for people. So they have to, first of all, it's heavy. They have a heck of a time getting it up. Secondly, as Naya said, it wouldn't fit through the door. And, and Emily alluded to the fact that maybe they would turn it sideways. Didn't really want to do that. You know what I mean? So they broke the handles off of the casket. And once they got it in the door, they had to cut the wall out to get it around. Once they got that thing in there, Mrs. Kennedy chose to sit with the coffin of her deceased husband. Now, I want to give you two <coughs> quotes that John Hames made about this instance. He was a sergeant who was the flight attendant. That was his job. Just like you go on a flight and get your beverages and those types of things and get you seated, make sure... He was the flight attendant for Air Force One, John Haynes. And this is what he said on two different... First of all, he said, I remember they broke off the handles trying to get the casket through the rear door of the Boeing 707. I put the broken handles with the casket when they took it off at the airport in Washington after we arrived. Not sure where those would be, but he put them back with the casket. Then he said... On the way back to Washington, the only thing Mrs. Kennedy requested was a glass of water. She refused to change her blood-stained clothes. She wanted everybody to see the blood on her clothes and realize what happened to her husband in Dallas. Would not take the clothes off. We'll get to that later. Now, once everybody got in the airplane, Kenneth O'Donnell wanted that plane off the ground. Why? I mean, let's get going here. Think about it. What? No? Not, they didn't even know he's on the plane yet. Just hang tight. Security? No. What's he thinks coming behind him? Think about what they just did at Parkland Hospital. What's he paranoid about? Why would he want the plane off the ground? He thinks police are coming? He thinks the Dallas police are coming to take the body. I mean, he's certain they're going to come behind him and take the body because they just took this thing illegally. Would the Dallas police have a right to do that? Absolutely. They never did. 
plan to do that, but did he know that? Heck no, he said, let's get this plane off the ground. Because he's convinced that the Dallas police is going to be showing up any second to take that body back to Parkland. So O'Donnell goes up to a general by the name of Godfrey McHugh, who was a military aide to President Kennedy, he said, get, let's get this plane in the air, let's get going here. So O'Donnell goes to General Godfrey McHugh, who is a military aide to President Kennedy, and tells him, get the plane in the air. So who does McHugh go to? The pilot. Very good, dear. James Swindle was the pilot. And he says to James Swindle, why haven't we taken off yet? And what did Swindle tell him? I haven't been given the orders to take off yet. Matter of fact, Malcolm Kilduff told me that something's going on that I wasn't to take off yet. So McHugh goes to the pilot, James Swindle, and says, why are we not taking off? And he said, well, I haven't been given orders to take off. Matter of fact, Associate Press Secretary Malcolm Kilduff told me something's going on. I'm not to take off yet. Well, who does McHugh go to next? Kilduff. And he says, why is this plane not taking off? And what was Kilduff as the press secretary? What was his response? Why wasn't the plane getting taken off? What was the delay? Lyndon Johnson wanted to be sworn in as president before they left. Well, McHugh looks at him, he says, what are you talking about? He's not even on the airplane. He flew back on the plane that he came here on. And he tells Kilduff, what are you doing here? He's not even on the plane. In which Kilduff responds, quote, well, you go tell that 6'4 Texan back there, he's not Lyndon Johnson. Johnson was on the plane. A lot of people didn't think he was on the plane. Why? First of all, we've got this unbelievable event that's happened and all the controversy and everybody's nervous and paranoid and everybody thinks Johnson, not everybody, but the people that haven't been in the vicinity of Johnson think he's not even on the airplane. And finally Kilduff has to say to McHugh, well you go tell that 6'4 Texan back there he's not Lyndon Johnson. Getting into the swearing in. There was no doubt that Lyndon Johnson wanted to be sworn in prior to departure. But another issue on the plane, which was minor compared to everything else, the police coming, <laughs> was that you ever sat in an airplane waiting for it to take off and there's delays and people are late? What's it like in the airplane? What is it like? You've been on it. Okay, but hot, no air circulating, right? There's, you can't turn the little thing on to get air, and it gets hot and uncomfortable. And everybody had been sitting there for quite a while, and they wanted to get off the ground. Okay? Well, Johnson wanted to be sworn in before the plane left. But whose permission does he want to do that? No? Close. No? Close. Jackie, Kenneth, Bobby. So he had earlier called Bobby when they were waiting for the president's body to arrive, he had earlier called Bobby and asked him two things. What's the constitutionality of me taking the oath? What, what's the right way to do it? And who can I get to do that that would be here in Dallas? So he calls Bobby and asks him what the constitutional requirements would be in taking the oath of office and who could administer the oath. At that point, Bobby didn't know, or he didn't care, one of the two, because his brother had been assassinated, and he said he would get back to him, which he hadn't done by this time. Is that all making sense? Mm -hmm. Now, this is a little off the cuff, you don't really have to write this down, but historians note that Vice President Johnson wanted the decision to be Bobby Kennedy's, that he took the oath, and he even told the Kennedy loyalists on the airplane Bobby wants me to take the oath in Dallas. He told Kenneth O'Donnell and David Powers and whomever was loyal to the Kennedy administration 
Bobby wants me to take the oath in Dallas. Later, Bobby insisted it was not him, but Lyndon Johnson's decision to take the oath in Dallas, which really made a lot of people mad on the Kennedy side of things. Does that make sense? Really made people mad on the Kennedy side of things. Because they thought Lyndon was being too pushy. I'll give you an example. That's a great question, right? And I kind of skipped this, but I'm going to go back to it. General McHugh, when he found out about this, swearing in, you know what he said angrily? My president is back there in that box. Not one to acknowledge Lyndon Johnson was going to be the new president. The Kennedy loyalists had a very difficult time on that airplane coming to the conclusion that Lyndon Johnson was going to be president. So they would have rather he be sworn in where? Back in D.C. where they didn't have to be a part of it. Lyndon Johnson insisted on it and convinced them that Bobby said he should. When they get back to D.C., it comes out differently. You can imagine how that went over. It was. It was interesting. But anyway, tomorrow we'll start by telling you who they get to do it and show you the famous Pulitzer Prize winning photograph and show you a short video on who took the picture and what it's worth today. Okay? It's pretty crazy. We haven't even hit the start of it yet.